So welcome everyone to our anniversary while our virtual event on protecting human rights in an age of authoritarianism. My name's Kira and I'll be your chair for this evening and I am really excited to be here. Um, before I go on to introduce the speakers, I just want to go through a few thanks because um, we're grateful to a lot of people this evening. Um, first off, we are extremely grateful to Garden Court Chambers for hosting this event and for the work of Amy, David and the marketing team behind the scenes. Um, I am also personally ever grateful to Ollie Percy, who is Wylal co-chair and barrister at Garden Court Chambers, who's been instrumental in organising this event. Uh, lastly, in terms of thanks, but not leastly, um, some of our awesome volunteers have prepared fact sheets ahead of tonight's event, which are available on our website. Um, thanks go to Lina Jewell, Wing S. Ng, Anuya Pai, and Samantha Orenstein for those. Um, some housekeeping from me, you've all used Zoom before, so I really don't need to tell you how to do that now. Um, please do put all your questions into the Q&A though, so our speakers can answer them. And then speaking of speakers, tonight I am extremely delighted, if not ecstatic, uh, to introduce our panellists. None of them need any lengthy introduction from me, but I'll just say a few words. Um, first up, we'll be hearing from Michael Mansfield QC, household name and foremost human rights barrister, who will hopefully be telling us something of his experience as a core participant in the now really long running undercover policing inquiry. Um, Michael, would you like to say hello to the attendees? Yes, indeed. Welcome and good evening. Thank you very much. Um, second in the running order is Chai Patel, who is a solicitor and legal policy director at the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants. Um, Chai heads up strategic litigation. And for those of you who don't know much about JCWI, the work they do is just incredible and includes the challenge to the right to rent scheme, um, which is under an act which essentially makes landlords immigration enforcers. And unfortunately, that was unsuccessful. Oh, it was overturned in the Court of Appeal. Um, but was really hard fought and well fought. So welcome Chai, we're delighted to have you here. Do you want to say hello as well to the attendees? Hi, um, yeah, well, Michael has already welcomed all of you, so I won't do that again, but hello. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, next up is Audrey Cheryl Mogan, who is a barrister at Garden Court, specialising in criminal defence and public law. Audrey is also a committee member at Black Protest Legal Support, and suffice to say her protest knowledge is pretty extensive, um, but she's also been central to some really fundamental campa campaign work, including the Commons Legal Challenge, um, which was a challenge to the requirement for defendants to state their nationality at the outset of criminal proceedings. And she's also a former YLR committee member, so it's nice to have you back, Audrey. Thank you, Kira, and uh, hello to everybody. Thank you. Um, our penultimate speaker will be Katie Watts, who is a solicitor at Liberty, formerly of the Public Law Project. She was also a Justice First Fellow, and I think it's probably safe to say that she's absolutely testament to what you can achieve through the scheme. The last time I saw Katie speak in person was actually at the LSE LGBT Featherstone Moot just over a year ago now. Um, where you were talking with Terry Daniels, who is a, gay, a well, veteran gay rights campaigner um, on the work to clear the names of men's convict, men convicted sorry, for the historic sex, um, sex offence, gay sex offence of impertuning. There's amazing work. But I'm hoping tonight that you're going to talk to us a little bit about what you've been doing most, late, most recently at Liberty. Thanks, Kira. I'm really happy to be here. Unfortunately, in regard to Terry's case, um, that's still very much ongoing, very slow progress with the Home Office. As, as is probably quite regularly the case, but it's it's good work and necessary work. Um, last, last but definitely not least, um, we have Shami Chakrabarti, who um, really, really, really needs no introduction from me human rights barrister, former head of Liberty and now Labour peer in the House of Lords. Shami has had an amazing career as a stalwart human rights activist um, and has given some really important speeches in the House of Lords recently um, to the domestic abuse bill, the overseas operations bill, and also as is really pertinent to this talk, the, uh, the CHIS Act, 
the um, Covert Human Intelligence Sources Criminal Conduct Act 2021. Um, and I'm hoping, Shami, that you'll be able to round us off with some of your wisdom. Thank you. I don't know about wisdom, but definitely solidarity. And um, I can't think of a better way to spend a, an evening in semi-lockdown, if that's, if that's where we are now, than with, um, with young legal aid lawyers because um, it's about solidarity and it's about, it's about the future. So I hope that we'll, um, we'll do the grim, the, the grim scrutiny and reckon, reckoning of the, um, of the situation this evening, but we'll also look, look forward at ways that we can, we can make a difference. Thanks for having me. Definitely, thank you. And I think you've just put it perfectly. The ways that we can make a difference is, is always got to be the focus. And I'm really hoping that tonight we will be able to talk about real solutions because I know that a lot of people feel like they're fumbling in the dark a bit at the moment and everything's a fight. Um, so in terms of, of how we're going to do this evening, the big questions that we'll be seeking to answer are twofold, really. So the first one is, is the UK witnessing a trend of increasingly authoritarian and regressive policy making. Now that's by no means a given. I suspect everybody will have their own answer to that question. I know what mine is, um, but I think it's probably the prior question. And then the second one is if so, what can we as young legal aid lawyers, activists and members of our community do to stop it or simply to, um, to encourage more progressive policy making? Um, so without any further ado and nothing further from me, I'll hand over to Michael Mansfield QC. Over to you, Michael. Yes, thank you very much. Um, one of the first occasions I ever heard Shami speak uh, in, in public was, a, it wasn't, it wasn't the first, but one of the first, raising money. I stood there and thought, amazing, amazing, because she's got another career. She won't admit to it. I mean, she's one of the greatest stand-up comedians I've ever heard. <laughs> and I laughed my socks off. Not that I was wearing any of that day, I can't remember. But I thought she, she's brilliant. So I'm, I'm hoping we might get a version of that tonight, I don't know. Because I think in one sense, as she pointed out that evening, you can often be much more effective with uh, humour which is directed. And she's the... Uh, past mistress or master, whichever word you want to use, at that. So I'd like to pay tribute to, to her. Now, it's interesting that she started with words about solidarity and collectivity, because those were sort of words I was going to end on, really, in a way. But we can start with those. And if I go just slightly over 15 minutes, do stop me. It's a question of age, you know, when you get to mine, you kind of, you lose track of the days and the minutes. On September the 7th last year, a man wielding a knife entered the offices of a well-known London firm of solicitors. And he was threatening serious harm to those in the reception area. And the object, which has been described in court, was in fact to take people hostage and put up Nazi flags and US Confederate flags in the windows of the offices. Uh, and it was a firm that, and I'm not gonna mention their name, for rather obvious reasons, a firm that specialized in immigration cases. And this was almost certainly an attack, which must have been horrific for those on the receiving end. An attack which had been provoked by the Home Secretary. Uh, provoked a few days before, because and you've used the word in introducing us. Activist lawyers, apparently, are now up for grabs. We are the target. Well, this isn't the first time, and I mention it because I think collectivity and solidarity has never been more important than the way we're going to, as it were, recontrol the streets, take back the high ground, is by 
showing that we're not we're not alone and large numbers of us are not going to tolerate it at the end of the day that's the one thing they do begin to listen to what they want to do is isolate we must not let that happen and so in a sense the question you posed about a, a trend i'm afraid i changed the word we're a long way down the line the tendencies towards authoritarian oppressive government started long ago uh, and I, I i hesitate before quoting a previous lord chancellor lord hailsham because he was the one who coined the phrase we are living in and he coined this you know decades ago we're living in an elective dictatorship and in fact that is exactly what we've got at the moment and at about the time he was saying that, it's interesting that another lawyer at that time, whose name may be familiar to you, very familiar to me because I do a lot of work in Ireland, South and North, and I know the family very well. Uh, and that's of Pat Finucane, who still has not received the justice the family deserve on that one. But then he was murdered in front of his family a few days after another politician in the Home Office, Douglas Hogg, had indicated that certain lawyers in the North of Ireland were too close to their clients. Effectively, they were not equivalent to terrorists, but you know that the line between them is fine. And there can be little doubt, but the two were linked. In between, we've had Mr. Blair he also attacked lawyers, blaming them for what the he thought the public perceived as meddling in human rights. So this isn't a new trend, this is an old trend of, of a tension between power-crazed politicians and those of us who want to try and protect people from that crazed, obsession that they have, which is the Actonian phrase of corruption of power. So this, this trend has to be looked at very carefully because, of course, after this attack, was there an apology? No. Was there a retraction? No. It gets worse. The Tories have their conference. And at that conference, Boris and the Home Secretary again spread the net. It's not just activist lawyers concerned with immigration. It's <coughs> lefty lawyers, do-gooders apparently we are as well, who are actually hamstringing is the word that was used. The criminal justice system is exactly the same as Mr. Blair's approach. So. Of course, this is being said on the back of some other rather, well, they're, they're not surreptitious. It's obvious what's going on. Because he, that is the prime minister, was smarting rather badly, uh, as it turned out, in the Supreme Court, by the fact that he couldn't quite get his own way over proroguing parliament. He couldn't quite get his own way about Brexit. And so a reaction to the independence of the judiciary and Lady Hale's magnificent performance in the House of Lords, um, it was made clear to the public, although whether the public, whether they're in red wall constituencies or blue wall constituencies, actually picked up on what he was really about. What he's really saying is two fingers. I'm not going to listen to this. I'm going to do, it's true dictatorship, exactly what I want. If another jurisdiction, another country were to act like this, oh, they'd all be up in arms and talking about oppressive oligarchs. That's precisely what's going on here. And for lawyers, we have to be aware that if you're talking about protecting rights, Besides looking at the individual bills, which I know others will talk, particularly Shami, in, in perhaps a little more detail. Uh, I'll come back to my own experience in, in one moment. But I think 
there is a real threat. It's not on the agenda tonight, but I see it as perhaps the, the biggest threat we have to face in if we're going to do our jobs. And that is, of course, not only do they want to restrict the powers of the Supreme Court, actually spelt out by, you know, our Attorney General, no less. But the way they want to do it is interesting. It's not actually about restricting the power of the judges. It's restricting the cases that get to them. And how are they going to do that? Well, you may or you may not know about the plans they have for judicial review. Uh, judicial review is one of the few ways in which a quite genuine and legitimate challenge can be made to legislation and obviously to decisions of institutions and government in particular. Uh, and in the last year or so, I've become very much involved in judicial review actions that are being taken. And I think the government was hoping that the Forks Review um, would come up with some draconian measures, but it didn't. Uh, and I, I was a bit worried that he would, but it, it, the review didn't go anywhere near as far as I've no doubt uh, the, this government wanted. So it's been put out to consultation uh, and just watch it because what they have in mind for judicial reviews is what they're calling an ouster clause in which certain types of action, and you know what they are, I know what they are, where challenging effectively the underlying policy which has caused the unlawful decisions is, is going to be excluded. So the ability to challenge decisions by courts and by government is going to be subject and, and whether this will be, as it were, achieved, I don't know, but I'm just saying we have to be alert to it because it's one of the few tools that we have left besides all the other ones that they're cutting down to size. In other words, you know, the coronavirus has been used to, well, not expressly exclude protests, but pretty well by not including it. And the police bill, you know, again, it's all to do with another way of doing it. They don't actually say the right to protest is bad, but what they do is they make it such that the police have enormous powers to judge it's almost religious, how many people will gather together for how long and in whose presence kind of thing. But actually, you know, the threshold is going to be quite different. It's if you disturb the peace of somebody else, in other words, the noise level. You can just imagine police officers going around with, with, with noiseometers. Oh, I'm sorry, you're a few decibels over. I'm going to have to, you know, and so I know it's a bit ridiculous, but it's serious. And, and it, they think that that's the kind of thing that they can do to intimidate the, the, the demonstrations, the marches f f of, of which they detest, no doubt, which is the environmental, extension rebellion marches, the Black Lives Matter marches, all of those. Those are the ones that they want to do something about. And so th th this, this attitude, this approach to it all, we have to bear in mind when we're fighting these bills that that's what they're on about. And if the House of Lords, as Shami will tell you, step in to amend it, they don't care. They reject it when it comes back to the Commons and they just carry on as before. So at the end of the day, the people who matter most in this are you and I, the lawyers. I'm sorry to elevate lawyers, but I think it's extremely important that we value what we do and we stand together because there are physical threats and psychological threats. And can I, am I watching the time? Have I been longer? I have actually. Um, sorry, <laughs> I apologize in advance. No, I, I wanted also just to say that, yes, I am a, a core participant in the undercover policing inquiry. Well, <laughs> it's so undercover, nobody knows where it is or whether it's happening, but it's really, I think uh, quite shocking it's taken so long. That's the first thing. Um, and I, I can't say too much because obviously I'm in it and I really should reserve comments. Uh, Imran Khan's representing me and he did an opening in which my thoughts were put out there in the public zone. But I'm very concerned about the, the, uh, the undercover aspect of this, not just because I'm a core participant, but because uh, the 
this is an inquiry which hasn't come to any conclusions. Meanwhile, they're putting on the statute or trying to put on the statute books a, a bill effectively, the spy cops bill as they're sort of in the in a vernacular, in which, although I think they've backtracked on um, permitting extraordinary acts of murder and so on by, you know, as if it's necessary for an under but officer to be authorized. I think they may have backtracked that much. But of course, as the undercover operation is, is, uh, is evidenced in the inquiry and anybody, it's, it's open there, it's in the public domain. The activities of this state within a state was going on for years, funded, by the public, unaccountable, well, we're going to find out whether, or I hope we do, who was accountable under the different names, the demonstration squad and so on. So it's a, the, the bill itself, and, and what I, I'm, I'm afraid to say, I was equally shocked, and I have been, I'm afraid, down the line, has been the position of the Labour Party. Because effectively, that's why I say, you know, it's down to us, have we got an accountable government? No, we do not. Do we have a parliament that's effective only for the purposes of allowing Boris to say what he wants and get away with it? And, it, it, you know, he's got a majority that allows, as Hailsham predicted, allowed um, a particularly difficult situation for anybody to challenge it within parliament. So it has to be outside parliament where, and they're trying to cut that off. So we have to be seen to be active and seem to stand together. And of course, you know, it's interesting when there's a when there's a threat to civil liberties, as long as the civil liberties are in China, they're not going to get exercised about it, which of course uh, brings me to a slight comment on the trade bill, uh, uh, which again, the Lord stepped in. And I think there certainly has been a sort of compromise there because uh, e effectively, what people a lot of people including some tories were very concerned about was allowing trade with oppressive regimes uh, which, which is all pretty rich considering what i've just been through in relation to our own and what they wanted was to ensure that we did not do business with regimes that indulged in genocide well that's fine as far as it goes because of course many regimes don't necessarily go as far as that the idea was to assemble a group, a committee, if you like, within the within Parliament of retired judges to decide what amounts to genocide, because it it is highly contested term, and a lot of states don't sign up to the International Criminal Court, so you can't ask them to do the definition. Now it's going to come into the scrutiny of what politicians. So it's going to be basically a committee within the House of Commons. Uh, not an not a independent set of judges, but politicians with a Tory majority who are going to decide whether, in fact, it is a credible allegation of genocide. Uh, and maybe if, if they feel it might be, they might press for a debate. Well, sorry, you know, it's the old story. So I think that scrutiny, which is what everybody was wanting, actually has to come from those of us who are either entering the profession or already there to ensure everyone's alert to the thrust of what is going on. So my answer to the question, sorry, I've taken a few minutes longer. My answer to the question, it's not a trend at all. It, it's, we're already there. The trend happened decades ago. And we, and, and in a sense, we, we now have to turn the tide back together. And I think, I think it's possible because they do get shamed from time to time by the actions that we take on behalf. And if, if we don't, juries do. How about that acquittal? The Ecoside Rebellion. So ordinary people, when they're given the chance, have a conscience, as do we. On that note, I will end. Thank you for listening for the moment. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, what, what a start to this evening, um, and particularly what you said, um, about if any other country was talking about this, we'd be or if this was happening in any other country, we'd be talking about oppressive oligarchs. Um, I was talking to Shami and Chai before we started about an experience I had when I was living in Russia 
um, in 2012. And I came back to the UK and told my friend what was happening. Um, and she just couldn't believe it and said, oh, it never happened in the UK. Um, but of course, here we are. Um, I'll leave Shami to come back on um, the interesting points that you raised about amendments from the House of Lords being rejected by the common, Commons and also the stance of the Labour Party. Um, we'll move on now to hear from Chai, um, who uh, I hope will give us a little bit of an insight from, from the experience of migrants and that perspective. Thank you very much. Over to you. Um, thanks very much. Um, I think starting with what Michael just just finished with. I think the, you know, the question that we were asked at the beginning is, are we heading towards authoritarianism? And I think um, quite a few of the things that I'm going to talk about in terms of the new plan for immigration and some of the other bills that are on on the table would suggest that we are. But I would also say that I'm not sure that it very much matters for our conversation uh, where we are on that road because what the legal profession should always be doing is fighting against the inevitable trend towards authoritarianism that you get from government. Um, that's, what, that's what happens when people are in authority. Uh, they have plans, sometimes they have petty plans, sometimes they have grand plans, but laws get in the way of them. And the trend is always to attack laws and to attack the people that uphold them. And so it's, you know, it's an eternal question. It's not one that needs to be relitigated every time something bad happens. It's, it's something that we should always be dealing with. Um, and, and another thing that Michael said, I think was very insightful, which is that, you know, a lot of the things that we're seeing are as the result of the government and Boris Johnson and, and potentially their personalities, but also the fact that they've been frustrated in many ways in the things that they have wanted to do. Um, and so when we look at the new plan for immigration and we, we look at the fact that what it's putting forward is effectively you know, a destruction of, of the refugee protection regime in the UK and, um, and, and a reversal of, 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 of decades of, of rights that have been, have been built up and established in the courts um, about, about the ways in which refugees and asylum seekers should be treated. It's worth remembering that the reason that we're talking about refugees and asylum seekers right now is that the Tory party's last decade of talking about the hostile environment and about undocumented migrants um, and about Europeans and about all of those other groups has failed. Um, it's succeeded in many ways that they've, they've passed legislation, but in, in, in the public eye, because of the Windrush scandal, because they overreached, because people stood up and, and said no, because the court stepped in at various points, uh, they can't talk about it anymore. It's toxic. The, the plan for immigration that, that Theresa May had, which in some ways is recycled into this plan and into the post-Brexit immigration system, was going to be a sort of grand announcement of the culmination of the hostile environment and the net migration target, driving immigration numbers down and all of those things. And that was gonna be the brand of culture war that they were gonna pursue. Um, and that was entirely derailed um, three years ago by lawyers, by activists, by campaigners um, who made that whole project completely toxic. Uh, that doesn't mean we're in a great position now. It doesn't mean that, you know, that, that things are okay. Uh, but it means that they've had to switch focus. And that's why you see that constant shift of government in terms of attacking asylum seekers and attacking migrants. And it tends to come when one of those attacks overreaches. And, and right now, what we're seeing with the new plan for immigration is an attempt very much to just change the conversation onto something else that, that, that they haven't undermined themselves on yet. Um, and I suppose what, what that means in terms of, you know, where we are on the path down towards authoritarianism with, with this plan, with the covert operations bill, um, with the, the CHIS bill, is all of those things are reactions to the government being worried um, either about defeats that they've suffered 
or defeats that they think that they're about to suffer. Um, so particularly, for example, with, you know, with, um, with, with the CHIS bill, they were very worried about the Privacy International case um, and the fact that there was quite a strong dissent and quite a compelling dissent in that case in, in the IPT. And they've decided because they've got an 80 seat majority, they're just gonna ram these things through parliament, establish legislation that allows them to do what they were doing anyway, which was potentially unlawful. Um, and they think that that would sort of be the end of the matter. Similarly with the judicial review reforms, the attacks on the Human Rights Act, all of those things are about seeking to establish through parliament, parliamentary legitimacy, through, demo, through democratic, the democratic mandate that they think that they have in parliament, things that they then think cannot be challenged in the courts or cannot be as easily challenged in the courts. And I suppose that takes us to the second part of the question, which is just, you know, in, in that context, in the context where you have campaigning and legal victories that lead to authoritarian governments with majorities seeking to simply change the law to get around the fact that what they were previously doing was illegal um, or risked being illegal, you know, what, what, what can you as lawyers do? What can we as lawyers do? And what is productive and what's counterproductive? And, you know, for example, were some of those battles that we had counterproductive because they led us down this route to the government deciding to legislate? Um, and the answer that I have on that, and I'm going to talk purely about the new plan for immigration um, and, and where we are with that, but I think, I think some of the lessons from it apply across the board, um, is that, you know, I think it, it's always a mistake, I think, to worry too much about not doing the right thing now because you're worried that the government will react against it. Um, they'll do the things that they want anyway. They pass the hostile environment in the face of widespread campaigning, but not because they had to, not because they were prevented from doing any of it, but because they, they wanted um, something to shout about, they wanted something to attack people on. Um, and the fact that things are happening as reactions now simply means that past campaigning was a success. It doesn't mean that those things or worse things wouldn't be happening now. You know, I think that if you look at the detail of the new plan for immigration, various bits of it are very vague, um, particularly things around uh, raising the standard of proof in asylum cases, things around um, creating a new fast track for, for cases that are in detention and a new fast track for cases of refugees who've come from abroad. And the reason that they're left vague is because of the number of defeats the government has had on those very issues in the past. Um, we're seeing a whole bunch of legislation that's extremely dangerous, and I don't want to underplay the danger of it, but it's also, I would say, very much a sign of an incredibly weak government, um, which is trying to do things that it knows that it almost certainly cannot in the long run do. In the meantime, of course, it will cause lots and lots of harm um, to people who are caught up in the measures and before the courts are able to step in. But we have seen these things before and they have been defeated before. And so I think, you know, as lawyers, it's a question of of really trying your best to exercise your judgment about the battles to fight, but but certainly not being afraid to simply take these things on, you know, head on, because these pieces of legislation always come back and there are huge similarities between some of the things that we're seeing now and things that we've seen in the past and other people will, I'm sure, speak more to that. Um, but, you know, as I said at the beginning, it's simply a constant process. It's, it's not something that we'll ever finish. It's not something that um, is, 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 is unique or new. Um, things are very bad right now and I think they're worse than they have been in some time and again I think other speakers will speak more to to the unique features of this particular moment but I think the main thing that I want to say is that it's it, it all of these battles are completely winnable um, and you can see if you look at the at the legislation itself you can see the weaknesses in it and you can see the things that they're scared of 
um, because there's so much in it that is is incredibly vague. And that is over 15 minutes, so I will stop now. Well, thank you so much, Chai. Um, we will, I would like to come back to that question about whether or not this is an inevitable trend of authoritarianism um, by people in authority. We'll come back to that, I think, um, afterwards, because I'm sure people have um, things to say on that. Um, I, really interesting what you say about government legislating because it's worried about defeats um, and actually that leads on nicely I think to what Audrey's going to talk about in terms of protests because of course the police crime sentencing courts bill was in direct response to the Extinction Rebellion protests and also the Black Lives Matter protests so Audrey over to you. Thank you Kira. Um, yeah so I mean the question that we were asked uh, you know is this a trend towards authoritarianism and regressive policy again. I don't think it's going to surprise anybody <laughs> when I say yes that's what I think um, and I'm going to just talk about it as Kira said one through the kind of lens of this clamp down and crack down on the right to protest um, and also both the right to protest and how it's being policed on the streets um, the new legislation and also um, I'm a junior criminal defense barrister so what I see happening in the courts, because a lot of these, a lot of the um, Extinction Rebellion climate change protesters um, and the BLM protesters will find themselves in magistrates courts um, and just kind of what I've seen as trends and why I think they're very worrying. Um, so obviously Michael's already spoken about this briefly, um, but obviously there's the police crime sentencing and courts bill um, that has come out and, you know, well, that the hope was that it would it, it could be rushed and come out in um, in a way that you know wouldn't allow for proper scrutiny um, of what it meant, um, and you know I think it was it, it uh, passed the voting stage in the Commons. I think it was like the sixteenth or seventeenth of March, and then the idea was that it would get to the committee stage soon after that. Um, but, you know, it was people taking to the streets and really, I mean, Sisters Uncut did such an amazing job on this to organize um, basically the kind of police crackdown bill, kill the bill protests um, so that it wasn't something that could just be ushered in quickly. Um, you know, I probably could never stop talking about the nationality requirement in the criminal courts, but something like that where it just happens, nobody realizes it's happened. And then all of a sudden everything's changed. Um, and it's just done in this quiet way. And I think, you know, be afraid, be very afraid uh, when governments try to rush legislation through. Because what was the purpose? This wasn't, it wasn't like COVID and I don't want to get into that, those arguments about it, but it wasn't a global public health crisis that required this, this piece of legislation to be rushed through. It was people taking to the streets to have their voices heard. Um, and yeah, I think it's a very troubling trend if then the government that we have tries to rush through legislation that is going to um, clamp down on that. I'm going to talk about in, in kind of brief, because I know While Owl is so amazing, we have such a great cross section of people that kind of join While Owl events. So maybe not everybody, you know, um, I know we have a lot of students and stuff, so maybe not everybody kind of knows the kind of intricacies. So I'll try to get into a little bit more detail, but effectively, I want to talk about, well, a few of the things that I mean, there's stuff I can't really get too much into, but there are things like, you know, um, increasing maximum sentences for vandalizing statues to 10 years imprisonment. I mean, we know where there's com that's coming from, right? Colston and the pulling down of, you know, somebody who's involved in the trading and slavery, enslavement of thousands of people that and so, okay, the idea, okay, let's people do that. Let's increase sentencing to 10 years, maximum sentences. There's also the horrific criminalization of the lifestyles of people who are Roma, Gypsy and travelers. Um, and so there's a lot in this bill that is problematic. Um, but I kind of wanted to talk about the stuff that impacts directly on protests. And that is the kind of change they want to, and, and Michael has spoken about it, um, the change they want to put into section, four, into section 14. Um, of the Public Order Act, which basically right now it means that if there's a protest or assembly going on um, and a senior police officer on the scene, and I'm going to read the words just to be very precise about it, reasonably believes that it may result in serious public disorder, serious damage to property, or serious disruption to the life of the community, or that the purpose of the persons organizing it 
is the intimidation of others with a view to compelling them not to do an act they have a right to do, um, then they can basically give directions to kind of um, limit the amount of time that people can be there or limit the location. And in fairness, I, I, like even bring it to an end. But the, the point behind this legislation is first and foremost, the police have an obligation to facilitate peace, uh, facilitate protests and assemblies. Um, that is their obligation. Um, and this is kind of, um, this legislation is drafted in that way. What they want to put in now um, is a clause that says, I just wanna read this because it's just so crazy to, to listen to, to read, um, that in the case of an assembly in England and Wales, the noise generated by persons taking part in the assembly may result in serious disruption um, to the activities of an organization which are carried on in the vicinity. The noise, like that's literally your voice. What they're saying is, um, yeah, they're, I mean, they're trying to muzzle our voices. Um, that's, I mean, there, there can be no other way of looking at that if what they're saying is we want to put something in that means that the noise created um, can be something to increase police powers and get them um, to uh, um, clamp down on protests. So effectively the threshold for limiting and um, uh, stopping protests has been significantly dis decreased. That's what they want. And it's something that we really, really should be worried about. Because as I say, when you talk about noise, you're just talking about our right to have our voices heard. Um, and what else do we know about what happens when we increase police powers? Well, I mean, the statistics are uh, abundantly clear. You know, people of color will be targeted and be affected more. Um, black people, nine times more likely to be stopped and searched. Um, black people are three times more likely to be arrested for offenses. And young black boys are kept in prison nine times, they're nine times more likely to be kept in prison. So um, we know that when we increase police powers, this is what happens to black, brown, racialized communities. And my colleague, um, both at Garden Court and at Black Protest Legal Support, she gave evidence today to the Joint Committee on Human Rights. And uh, she said it better than I could, but what she said was this, the police already use and abuse existing powers. So it was Zara Hassan, I should have said that. But the police already use and abuse existing powers to criminalize our communities. This bill would just entrench institutional racism through policing and punishment. Um, and that's the fact. Um, and it's, 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 of course, this is coming about because of the amazing climate change protests, but it's also coming uh, about because of the Black Lives Matter protests. And that is something, you know, the government should be ashamed about because both of these huge protests, what are we protesting? Climate change, science is not controversial. And we know that the risk our planet is in. And Black Lives Matter, oh my God, like again, it's not controversial. Uh, you know, a man in America died, but we had to look at what we do and the policing of uh, black communities in this country as well. And um, to that effect, as um, a member of black protest legal support, what we have also noticed is this. So I, um, you know, we train legal observers and we had legal observers on the ground during the BLM marches last year. And when I was there on the ground, it is just such a crazy thing. So we have our bibs and stuff and it says legal observer on the back and we're all standing there and, and just chatting about where we're gonna disperse. And the whole point of legal observers are to monitor protests. And, you know, there is a group of police officers. This is, it was just a crazy thing to see that, you know, were effectively taunting and mocking us. Um, you know, asking things like, oh, you just, do you really think you have any powers? Um, or some of the other quotes we had. Oh, yeah, it was things like, are you just here to cause trouble? And that kind of stuff, it's just like schoolyard antics from the people that are supposed to police our communities. Um, and that, you know, the tagline is to keep us safe. And that just this kind of bullyish kind of, um, yeah, well, I would call schoolyard antics. So that was last year. Obviously, we know there's tons of people kettled and um, I'm, I'm sure Katie will talk a bit more about this, but this year um, during the protests that Sisters Uncut organized um, and you know, it was about the crackdown bill, um, 
there were legal observers. I wasn't on the ground that day, but there were legal observers, again, fully bibbed, legal observer written on the back, literally taking down notes of arrests that were taking place. Um, and then they were turned around and the police turned around and arrested them as well. Uh, and what does that say when the state starts to arrest the people that are there um, to hold them to account, to monitor their actions and to ensure that, you know, they're not being violent towards uh, arrestees. I think that's something, you know, um, we, they were threatened with arrest and then were arrested. And, and again, again, unsurprising to anybody, but three out of the four of them that were arrested were um, black and brown individuals. So um, they were arrested and, uh, you know, in case um, anybody doesn't know, you know, the issue was, oh, you're in breach of COVID regulations. Well, actually you're not because there is an exemption for people who are there to volunteer or work. And, you know, hilariously, Cressida Dick talked about uh, Kate Middleton being there to work, um, but legal observers were being arrested. So um, yeah, they were using Pava spray, they were kettling people. And again, the ridiculousness of saying that you can't protest because of COVID and then kettling people and using Pava spray, which is going to affect their lungs. It's just, you know, um, it, 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 they don't believe it. They're just, they're, this is a clamp down on our right um, to be able to, to, to have our views heard um, and to assemble with each other. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I don't have to say it in, in this group of people, but, you know, and we know what this, con uh, this government thinks about the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, but, you know, the fact is, and this is, I just like this quote, but uh, it was from, uh, or just as laws in the case of Tabernacle, which is a, a peace camp um, protest, but rights worth having are unruly things and demonstrations and protests are liable to be a nuisance. They are liable to be inconvenient and tiresome or at least perceived as such by others who are out of sympathy with them. Um, and and that, that's the fact, right? I mean, there's no point in saying, well, here's a place where no one can see you, where you're not gonna bother anyone, where nobody can hear your noise, where you can protest there. Well, that's not really a right to protest. Um, and I think this bill and these clauses in this bill, that's really what it's trying to do. Um, I'm gonna be very quick just to say, I also want to put this in the context of kind of the next step of what happens when people are arrested because thousands of Extinction Rebellion protesters were arrested um, and put through the criminal justice system, a criminal justice system that is already with such a huge backlog of actual cases. Um, there is just no stopping them. People are just being brought through the, um, uh, arrested, charged, um, and, and going through trials. And, you know, I think that is also problematic. Um, and the kinds of things that I've seen. So one of the things is when people are arrested, uh, it's, it's a trend that prosecutors are asking for protesters to be remanded in custody um, just because they've been protesting at different places. And you're just, how is that proportionate? H how is that the way that people who are protesting should be treated. Um, the other thing is, you know, the kind of rush, especially in the magistrates courts, to have these trials dealt with remotely um, so that individuals, you know, aren't there in person. And there's lots of issues. I mean, Penelope Gibbs has done some great work on the issues that um, remote justice isn't really justice and how difficult it can be for people to engage. Um, and then it's just a thing that it's almost like single justice procedures, but effectively, if what I've seen uh, in the magistrates courts are, even though it's really difficult for people to know exactly what day their case, their first appearance in the court will be. Um, and there's lots of confusion and even my instructing solicitors will have to do a lot of work to try to get those dates. Um, if you turn up in court and you aren't there, and even though the courts know that there's problems with communicating to people about what day they're supposed to be there for their first appearance, not a trial, it's just their first appearance in a court. Um, I've actually seen the court say, fine, let's just go ahead to right then and there, um, trial in absence. 
what? You know that there might be an issue with this person not even knowing. And if they didn't even know they were supposed to come for a first appearance, what? I mean, there's no way that they're going to be found not guilty without even being there, without any representation there, without having been able to engage in this process at all. And then they might have a criminal conviction for protesting and might not even know about it until they try to go and apply for something or do anything. And it's, it's really, really problematic because they're arresting and charging thousands of people, but there's no time to deal with them. So let's just deal with them like it's some kind of factory farm. So yeah, it's sad, it's shocking. And this is all, of course, like I was saying, arresting LOs are all, again, in the context of challenges to the Human Rights Act, challenges to judicial review, all the ways in which we can hold this state and this government to account. So it is problematic, it is scary. Um, but uh, I think the second part of the question is what young people can do, what young legal aid lawyers and what young people and activists and members of the community could do. Well, you know, first vote for better leaders. I mean, that's, that's out there. Um, but also people kind of coming together and, you know, at my family dinners and stuff, because we're cool like this, we often, uh, you know, there's some arguments from some sides about like, oh, you're just sitting on the grass with a placard. Is that really going to change anything? Well, it, it has, and it is. Um, and it's it's amazing to to see. And you know, obviously, uh, Michael mentioned the Shell Oil case. It's, uh, it's it's fantastic to see that result, uh, and that you know, um, ordinary people kind of understand the importance um, of the right to protest and the importance to protect our planet and to protect the people in it. So I think there's lots to be done. But these are the kinds of things that change over generations. Um, it, you know, they're not quick fixes, but Thank you. Thank you so much, Audrey. Um, and I love what you said there about family. Um, I'm a big fan of an American author and activist called Adrian Marie Brown. Um, she's super, super cool. Um, but she talks about the need, she, she talks about this thing called emergent strategy and the need to make um, inch wide, mile deep change and to focus very much on the small changes that we can make in, in our own lives and getting into right relationship with um, the people around us and, um, and our communities. Um, so I did like that family element. And of course, what you said about um, the fact that we have to see the impact on minoritized groups, as well as the attacks on lawyers and journalists, all of these things, historically, they come together, don't they? I mean, we don't need to educate anybody on what happened in Nazi Germany or in Soviet or in the Soviet Union. I mean, this, this is tried and tested um, over decades and centuries. Um, so thank you so much for that. And obviously you mentioned as well in your, in your talk about the recent arrests of four legal observers and Liberty's role in that. And so with the mention of Liberty, I will pass over to Katie. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kira. Um, I'm going to start by going back to what Michael said at the beginning. Um, so by putting these specific legislative proposals that we're talking about today into context as part of a much wider attack on the rule of law. Um, I think it's important to kind of note that they're happening alongside proposals to reform the HRA and judicial review, which when you take them together, really looks like an attempt to put government decision-making entirely beyond the reach of the law. Um, the latest government review of judicial review closes tomorrow. So we've had a generous six weeks from when the proposals were first published to respond to them. Um, I'm not gonna speak about the proposals in details, but I just want to say that as has been widely reported and as Michael noted, the government has deliberately misrepresented the findings of the independent review, which was convened by itself um, in order to provide cover to its own proposed reforms, which go way beyond the terms of reference of the review. Um, I think if the proposed reforms are all implemented, they will severely limit the function of judicial review as a check on executive power. Um, the only explanation for proposals to restrict the court's power to remedy unlawful decisions and to remove judicial oversight entirely from the exercise of some types of power is that they're part of a concerted effort by the government to evade judicial oversight altogether. When you read the proposals alongside the increasing propensity to legislate by statutory instrument, it's also clear that the government's seeking to avoid both judicial and political scrutiny. At the same time, um, the government's also trying to crack down on our right to hold the government accountable by other means. Um, but I don't really think I've got anything to add to what Audrey has already said about the clampdown on our protest rights. So I'm going to talk about two other 
less well reported, but just as concerning aspects of the police uh, policing bill, police bill, Liberty are calling it the police crackdown bill. So I'll go with that, um, which are the impact on the gypsy Roman traveler community and the new police powers relating to serious violence. Um, I'm going to go into these in a bit of detail, um, partly because the briefing notes that you've been sent don't cover these provisions. Um, so first of all, part four of the bill contains provisions which criminalise trespass. Um, they provide that once notice has been given to someone by the occupier of land, failing to leave will now be a criminal offence. Police and local authorities already have the power to require trespassers to leave land and to remove vehicles. But the bill goes much further. It removes public authorities entirely from the process and creates new criminal offences. There's also no provision in the bill for what's going to constitute valid notice and no procedure to be followed before notice is given. It's also worth pointing out that these provisions follow a government consultation in response to which only 21% of police forces agreed with the proposal to criminalise trespass. So it's another example of the government agreeing not just the activists and left-wing lawyers who respond to their consultations, but also the bodies which it expects to be on its own side. When it doesn't get, its, get the answer it wants, it carries on regardless. Um, it's really clear from the government discourse around the bill that these provisions are squarely aimed at the Gypsy Roman Traveller community, um, and predominantly that's the community that it's going to criminalise, but they're not the only ones who will be affected by the pro proposals. Rough sleepers could be forced to move on under threat of prosecution and protest camps like Greenham Common or Occupy would also be criminalised by the bill. The powers transform what would, would have been a civil dispute between two private actors into a criminal offence and there are no safeguards against misuse by private landowners. The other aspect of the police crackdown bill that I'm going to talk about is part two, which contains new duties and powers aimed at reducing serious violence. So the intention of tackling serious violence is obviously one which Liberty supports, but the purpose in the bill, again, are entirely unsubstantiated by evidence and go against the findings of the serious violence strategy consultation. Um, I'm just also going to go through these, detail, these proposals in a bit of detail. So first of all, serious violence is defined astonishingly broadly. The bill clarifies that reducing serious violence includes ensuring that individuals do not become victims. So by defining as anyone affected by serious violence as a victim, they include potentially everyone. So the new duties and powers have a hugely wide reach. The key duty requires public authorities to collaborate to prevent and reduce serious violence and to identify the kinds and causes of serious violence and implement a strategy to tackle them. There's a corresponding duty to consult educational, prison and youth custody authorities that gives rise to clear parallels with the prevent duty. Any strategy to identify at-risk individuals is going to pose exactly the same privacy and discrimination concerns that have been well documented in relation to the fund. The bill also grants local authorities, the Secretary of State and the police the power to bypass any obligation of confidence owed to a person making a disclosure of information unless the disclosure would contravene data protection legislation. It's really unclear kind of what that means or how that will work in practice, but it's clear that the bill anticipates that the sharing of information is going to be a central part of the new violence reduction strategies. So from our perspective, it's hard to see how the erosion of relationships of trusts will contribute to any reduction in serious violence. Further, the police will have the power to oblige any relevant authority to provide them with the information that they request, as long as it will be used for the purpose of enabling them to assist the authority. Power to assist is again framed in an extremely broad way and the police could easily justify seeking access to information relating to any potential perpetrators or victims on the basis that they're sim simply implementing a serious violence reduction strategy. Um, we think there's a real risk that police bodies will engage in discriminatory practices, sorry, public bodies will engage in discriminatory practices such as the creation of databases similar to the widely criticised gangs violence matrix with very little impact on rates of serious violence. So those are the two kind of legislative proposals that I wanted to speak about. And now I'm going to um, deal with the question posed by Wyla, which is what can we do about, about these proposals? So um, first of all, I want to pick up on something that Chai said, which is that they're attacking these accountability mechanisms and trying to shut them down from protest to judicial review precisely because they're effective. So there is a case for hope. So I want to start with that. But um, in terms of how we respond to the government's war on accountability, um, there are just a few other things to say. I think 
first of all, we need to find a way to tell a positive narrative about human rights um, and a way to counter the government's strategy of using the perceived actions of minorities as justification to undermine the rights of everyone. Um, it's already been mentioned, but in the same way that the policing bill is framed as a response to Black Lives Matter, the form to judicial review is framed as a response to abuse of the courts by migrants. We do need to respond to those imminent threats, but we also need to win the longer term debates about equality. Um, I think speaking as a lawyer, I think lawyers have a real tendency to see things from a binary perspective. We're very good at criticizing government policies and actions, but we also need to be able to articulate a positive vision. Um, we mustn't forget to explore the wider scope of possible options and offer something else to people. Secondly, um, and related to the first point, I'm going to disagree with Michael about something that he said. I think we need to think beyond the courtroom, um, partly because the government is doing everything it can to limit the court's powers um, by reform of judicial review and the Human Rights Act, but more importantly, because in order to achieve real change, we need much better advocates for human rights than judges. We've seen, and we talked tonight about how the government narrative framed the Miller judgments, and we know how they demonize lawyers. I don't think we can rely on the courts as the last line of defense for our human rights if we don't have some level of grassroots support. Um, and I find the, the kind of attitude of see you in court sometimes a bit concerning, even when it's aimed at public bodies that are wielding their power unlawfully, I think it can be unhelpful and alienating to a lot of people, which kind of takes me to my third point, which is that although I don't want to be too discouraging about the role of lawyers and talk aimed at lawyers given by lawyers, um, I do wonder if instead of embracing the narrative of activist lawyers, we need to acknowledge that the perceived elitism of lawyers does resonate for some people, and it has some basis in truth. I think addressing problems of social mobility and diversity in the legal profession would help, um, but I also think we need to foster genuinely reciprocal relationships with grassroots organisations and build a much wider and positive movement for human rights. Um, and finally, I think we have to accept that lawyers might not be the best spokespeople for justice. Um, and we need to do what we can to make it safe for the people who use the law, for our clients, for our communities, um, to tell their own stories. Thanks. Thank you so much for that, Katie. And for what it's worth, I, I, I agree with all of your points, particularly about um, people with lived experience of the law and the justice system being the advocates. Um, for change. Um, so thank you so much. And last but not least, Shami, I mean, we've heard so much, there's probably quite a lot you want to say now um, that you hadn't thought about before, but we're eager to hear from you. Thank you. Well, well thank you so much. And it, it, it is, um, it, it's, a, it's a privilege, but it's a daunting one to follow such brilliant expert speakers who have, have, have you know, said so much and offered so much substance um, uh, to this evening's discussion, but I'm going to try and be succinct to allow the maximum um, time for uh, for discussion, um, for you know, for, for questions, comments, and and our favourite as um, as as activist lawyers, which are those um, those comments that are very thinly disguised as as questions. So so a rant, and then don't you agree? Um, but I think I want to do three three things. Uh, the first is uh, to speak a little more about the SpyCox legislation because you asked me to, to do that and it, and it is a, a relevant um, piece of this, uh, of this picture. Secondly, I want to address the question about the wider authoritarian trajectory that has been, that has come up again and again and, and I think is important to address uh, so that we can then uh, talk about the third piece, uh, which is what we can do. So, so I'm going to try in my 15 minutes to um, to, to look at all three, obviously superficially, but I'm, um, but um, but I think so much of the groundwork is is, is there already, um, and I have to return the compliment to um, to to Mike. Um, he, you know, he he was far too he was far too flattering about my ability to um, to be funny, which is which is not, of course, my general reputation. So clearly he, he, you know, we met a long time ago on a, on a, on a good night before, um, before experience um, caught up with me, but, but, um, but he has just been uh, such a major contributor to, to our legal and 
civil liberties landscape for so many years. Um, and I think there are things we can learn from his example and, it, it, and, and the example of other great activist lawyers, you know, him at the bar, Gareth Pierce and Louis Christian as solicitors, that, you know, the list goes on and there are techniques like legal observation, for example, that go right back over many decades that we can now combine with um, modern tech like smartphones that allow every protester and legal observer to actually be um, uh, a walking CCTV camera but turned on the, on the police. So there's, there's so much to be inspired by and to learn from in the past and internationally, as well as so much to be concerned about. So on the, uh, I'm gonna call it the Spy Cops Act. Let's not be too legalistic about the covert human intelligence sources, open brackets, criminal conduct, close brackets act 2021, though that is a grim title in itself. Um, for those not um, familiar with it, uh, it is, as Mike said, an extraordinary, extraordinary piece of legislation. So um, the, the, the activities of, 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 it's not just spy cops we're talking about, we're talking about, yes, the police, and yes, the spooks and the spies, but we're also talking about informants in the community. We're talking about hosts of people, including very volatile and criminal people, who necessarily um, are, are, are employed from time to time by the authorities to um, to to rat on their you know on their colleagues, to put it bluntly, and this bill is allow it is authorizing all of these people potentially. So those who are officers of the law, those who are officers of MI5 and MI6, those who are employed by employed by all sorts of regulatory agencies, you know, dealing with the environment and, and financial services and gambling and so on. So uh, all of those people working for Quangos, but also for these, for these people in the community, including, including children, including people under 18. Um, we're allowing for them to um, not just be undercover, because they've been able to be undercover for a very long time, but we're now allowing them to commit criminal offences, but to commit criminal offences with impunity, with advanced immunity licences, a licence to commit crime, which is why some people called it the licence to, to kill bill at one stage. Um, and people can throw their hands up in horror and say that's hyperbolic, but, but actually it isn't because that is theoretically possible under this legislation on its face. Um, now, Mike said there are exceptions for serious offences. There aren't actually with this, that there are for the overseas operations um, bill, which is not yet an act, um, because actually the House of Lords was, was more muscular in relation to, to that, as was the Labour front bench. Um, but less muscular, I'm sorry to say, in relation to, um, to spy cops. Why? Um, because the government argument was, if you create exceptions, if you say there's a list of very heinous offences that these um, spies in the community cannot commit, then, um, then uh, drug dealing gangs and organised criminal gangs and terrorist cells will subject people to, to a test. And they will test people, but in relation to the crimes that they can commit. Um, so that was that was their argument. But they but there was also a, a, another argument that we don't need to create um, safeguards like exceptions to the kind of criminality we're going to authorize in advance in secret. We don't need to do that because of the Human Rights Act. So the Human Rights Act will be in itself a limit on the crimes that can be authorized. That was the argument time and again from the government. And I'm sorry to say that the, the opposition was not to, to my mind muscular enough in opposition to that particular piece 
of, of legislation. So there we have it now. And, 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 and just to finish in relation to that, you know, everything that, that, that Mike is engaging with in this, in this inquiry, that happened before this legislation. So the abuses that happened in relation to trade unionists, in relation to um, in relation to environmental protesters, including women who had children with undercover um, cops, and they're you know living under their legends of, of seven or eight years, you know acting like spies when they're supposed to be police officers, but there's no investigation that's ever going to lead to um, to a charge. Um, everything that happened that happened before this legislation what are the dangers of what might happen now and of course you know being formerly of liberty um you know i you know liberty was founded liberty nccl you know katie will tell you was founded after the abuses of hunger marches back in the 30s and of course one of the things we have to be afraid of is the use of agent provocateur so you put undercover cops or not even cops, members of the community into a protest movement for the purposes of um, inciting violence or perpetrating violence in order to um, discredit that organization. And that's what happened with hunger marches, that's happened at various times. Um, and you know, we'll see what comes out of the inquiry, but, but how great a the risk now with an actual advanced immunity certificate whereas the previous position was you'll get guidance and of course there will be times when you you act in the public interest and you are committing a crime but you're doing it in the public interest you do it with guidance from uh, the police or mi5 or mi6 or whoever it is and you can rely um, on prosecutors not to prosecute you in the public interest. And if they, if they do, you can throw yourself on the mercy of, um, of a jury for a perverse acquittal because you, you, know, you, you prevented that terrorist incident. But there are no instances of these rogue prosecutors or these rogue juries that have been um, perpetrating these terrible injustices. So that's the the terrible spy cops uh, legislation. And um, we'll now have to fight that legislation in court, I'm afraid, because sometimes, because I agree with Katie, and I've said this for many, many years, human rights have to live in the living room and the police station and on the streets and in the newsroom and the classroom, not just in court. But I also agree with Mike that you need the court as, as, the, final, as the final referee when all, when all else fails, but, but we also have to protect judges because they don't command armies and, and therefore we need the, the, broader, the broader coalition. So this, this authoritarian trajectory, well, I, I, I think that it is, um, it, to my mind, completely undisputable that we're, we've gone very far down this authoritarian road in Britain. Um, as Mike said so eloquently at the beginning, it's been going on for many years. He cited uh, the late Lord Helsham, the elected dictatorship, but we have been looking at this trend uh, under governments of, of all colours, I'm sorry to say, for a very long time. And, and more recently, what are we looking at? Well, I think we're looking, yes, partly at um, the, the, the conventional instinct of all governments to be irritated by opposition, to be irritated by lawyers and judges when they are obstructing your, your, your policy. That, you know, that's, that's understandable. We're, we're looking at that irritation, but we're also looking at deliberate, deliberate uh, perpetration of culture war. Um, and it's been, it being done quite deliberately to divide and rule. So yes, it's very convenient to, um, to get rid of judicial review or the Human Rights Act or to quell protest. It, of course, it's very convenient to do all of these things, to give advance immunity to your informants. Um, that's all convenient. It's all, if you're an instinctive authoritarian, as, lots of, as, as a lot of politicians are uh, across the left-right economic divide, 
Um, you know, that's all fine. But in addition, we've now got deliberate, deliberate culture war being per perpetrated by what I believe to be a far right government. And I don't use language like that lightly because language matters and we're lawyers and we don't throw these terms around, you know. I don't run around calling people fascists. I probably did as a teenager, but I learned not to do that, not to cry wolf about these things subsequently. And I have made common cause over many years with liberal conservatives over civil liberties issues, but we're not dealing with liberal conservatives now. That is, that is my argument. I had this argument with... Um, with Sir Geoffrey Cox on national radio a few weeks ago, I think it was any questions, and I made the assertion, this is a far right government. And he said, how on earth can you say that in the light of the various governments around the world that are hard right governments? And I said, well, I, you know, like Mike, I said, well, I give you an illegal shutdown of parliament. And I give you wanting to put asylum seekers offshore, and I give you wanting to criminalize peaceful dissent, do it, I could go on. And he didn't come back. He's the former conservative attorney general, to his credit, resigned clearly over, over advice that wasn't welcome, but he did not come back. And I think that, I think to my mind, that spoke, that spoke volumes. Because when you, when, when you put the picture together, there are other things that we haven't had time to mention this evening that are part of this, this jigsaw. Voter ID, right? The government now wants more and more voter ID. It wants to make it harder for, for poor people and working class people to be able to vote without expensive ID like passports and driving licenses that just aren't, aren't part of that part of their lives or, the, or, or their means. We've had, um, we've had attacks on the trade union movement in recent years. Mike mentioned the Human Rights Act, judicial review. Um, this is a very, very broad picture. And, and again, this culture war. Now, this particular iteration of the Conservative government uh, was born of Brexit. And Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings may have, you know, famously fallen out in, in, in recent months, but the techniques, the techniques that they developed during the culture war that was the, the Brexit referendum are techniques that they have built upon in government. And we're talking dog whistles and we're talking foghorns. And I recommend two, um, two documentaries um, to anyone who wants to, you know, to to think about this some more, you know, politically, not just not just legally. One is a is a documentary called The Brink, which is a documentary that follows Steve Bannon, who is who was, you know, Donald Trump's Dominic Cummings, and it follows him in his discussions with people like Nigel Farage and far right, out right people from across Europe and uh, the advice that he gave people about how to wage culture war for the purposes of divide and rule to distract people from, from you know, from economic matters of, and, and socioeconomic injustice to turn them on each other, et cetera, et cetera, to use immigration. And he says in terms to Nigel Farage in that documentary, you know, um, Sanders, uh, Corbyn, they'll never be able to do what we can do because they won't do what we'll do around immigration. Okay, and now we've got other, other culture wars, not just, not just immigration, but Black Lives Matter, Extinction Rebellion, them and us, divide people, urban, rural, generationally, woke, unwoke, right? Uh, and we're doing this deliberately as a distraction from chronic inequality and economic injustice. So um, that's the first movie. And the second movie that I, I recommend is the, the 13th, which many of you have, have probably seen on, on Netflix or, or what, um, and, and, that's, and that's worth watching too, because you know, you know, the 20th century is probably the American century. Right? Britain, Britain was great probably in the late 19th century, had its great, 
empire with the pink bits, but the, in, but, but the 13th, which talks about the, the through line from slavery right through to mass incarceration also reveals the politics of that and the politics of, um, of, of, of these dog whistles around law and order and structural racism and so on. And, and, and if you watch that, you'll see so much has been emulated, um, you know, emulated in Britain. You have, you have Nixon's, you, you have slavery, you have Jim Crow, you have the civil rights movement, you have the backlash to that. You have Nixon's war on drugs, which is responsible for the incarceration of so many, so, so many um, black Americans even, even today. And then you have Bill Clinton saying, I'm sick of losing these law and order arguments. So I better get with some of these law and order arguments too. And then I'm gonna be responsible for mass incarceration. And you see that in, the, in, in British politics too, because ours is a sovereign nation that bows to no foreign will, but whenever they, they cough in Washington, they spit on Parliament Hill. That's an old bit of toilet public toilet graffiti from the from the 1980s that Mike may remember in the days when they, they had public toilets in the United Kingdom. So <laughs> yes, of course. So yes, of course, there's an authoritarian trajectory. But those two moves, I, I reckon I, I do. I do recommend The Brink about Bannon and the organized outright globally and particularly in America and Europe and uh, and the 13th about structural structural racism in the US and about dog whistle politics and how you do it and how they're doing it even now. So that's the sort of that's the sort of grim bit. Um, what can, what can I say that's a bit more positive about how we work together to combat this this new and not so new populist nationalist authoritarianism of our, of our far right government, because that's what I'm calling it. Come on, they've purged the liberal Tories. They've purged the Dominic Greaves and even Amber Rudd and so on and so forth. This is what we're dealing with now. So um, I agree that as before, as Mike has been doing throughout his career, we work as lawyers, but we also work in broad coalitions with these protest movements, with journalists, with international collaborators and people people doing this elsewhere in the world whether in the US where there's a bit more hope now um, with with some of Biden's um, positions and remember Biden's positions aren't just Biden's positions as they would have been you know a few years ago they're Biden's positions now with the squad you know biting at one you know pulling it pulling at one ankle um, you know, there, there are people that we can learn from and collaborate with uh, internationally and not just usual, not just usual suspects. You know, sometimes when we were dealing with authoritarian tendencies during the war on terror, we found some very interesting and unusual allies in retired law enforcers, in retired spooks even. You know, sometimes the, sometimes the unusual advocate, the unusual suspect can can be can can be very helpful because whilst I do think that uh, this culture war is a is a distraction from from socioeconomic inequality, that doesn't mean there aren't people who we might not agree with around tax and spend who who who, who nonetheless care about the rule of law, which is which is why Mike's point about lawyers and legal training and legal DNA I do think is relevant as well as the Katie points about it can't always be coming through the mouths of the mouths of, of lawyers in, in the media or on the street and so on. I do think street protest matters. I, I, I do. I remember that I, you know, I remember the poll tax. I remember other great street protest movements. Um, they are part, they are part of the broader, uh, the broader picture, and which is why it's great to, to you know to listen to, to Audrey and to Katie to see that, that, that young lawyers are still doing legal, legal observation. We've got to use new technology. We've got to do it in new ways. We need to register bad behavior by police officers against, against lawyers. We, uh, I, I think that the Clapham Common protest vigil 
I should say, was uh, was a real headache for the government. And it's one of the reasons why the police bill has been delayed. Because that was a that was a vigil. That was not Black Lives Matter. That was not Extinction Rebellion. That wasn't a protest that was too black or too green. That was a lot of, uh, of ordinary women, young and some not so young, who were who were there um, because of uh, a, a woman's murder, um, allegedly by a metropolitan police officer. It was um, a game changer, and um, and the um, and the handling of that um, of that vigil by the police was an absolute disgrace, and that changed a lot of people's minds in the media in parliament and, and you know and, and, and moments like that need to be remembered and people need to be reminded because everybody loves protest and everybody loves freedom of expression when it's their own it's other people's that are more expensive and so around this police bill in particular there is the opportunity around part three in particular part four is is very important too, because I agree with what Katie said about the the attack on uh, on traveller communities. In in that respect, uh, you know, part four of the bill is is like the East African Asians legislation. You know, it's euphemistic, but we know that it's racist. It it, it it's targeted at a particular community. So it's vital that that you know other aspects of the of the bill are fought. But part three is an is not just vital in itself it's also what it represents. And it also presents an opportunity to appeal to people who normally wouldn't care about this authoritarian trajectory. They don't see it, they don't care about it. They're worried about the pandemic. They're worried about, about how they're gonna make ends meet through this pandemic and beyond. But part three of this, of this bill is an assault on anybody who protested for Brexit, let alone against it, I was in the porrogation case. I, I, I intervened in, 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 in the porrogation case that Mike referred to at the beginning of this. And when I came out of the Supreme Court, I was subject to a protest and it was rowdy and it was a little bit racist and all the rest of it. I didn't dream of calling the police or, 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 or even complaining about that protest because it's so vital, but those people would be subject to this legislation too, as would people who, you know, who want to go in for fox hunting and anti-vaxxers and all sorts of people who want to say things that I don't agree with. So I think that this, that aspect, part three of this legislation is, it is a terrible threat, but also a wake up call and therefore an opportunity to broaden, to broaden the movement for rights and freedoms in this country. And then I think just, just finally, we need to hone our arguments. And I think the one thing that all of these measures have in common is, um, is hypocrisy. Because the rule of law sounds like quite an arcane um, proposition, but um, what the spy cops legislation should teach us is it's, it's one law for them. Because they, you know, they bill all these measures as law and order measures, but actually they are anti rule of law measures. And if you think about one of the one of the wake up calls in the pandemic for people, one of the one of the things that got people most cross with the government, which is now very popular again, uh, we'll see what happens with the, you know, with the curtains at, at number 10. But people were very, very angry about Barnard Castle. The polling on that was pretty devastating for, for how people felt about Dominic Cummings' trip to Barnard Castle. They couldn't see their loved ones, even their loved ones locked away in care homes. Um, but he was going on his frolics because it's one law for them and another law for the rest of us. And that's the problem with the spy cops legislation. It's licensing criminality for some people in the name of clamping down on criminality for the rest of us. And judicial re review, do away with judicial review. That means government isn't subject to the rule of law anymore. And this one rule for them um, proposition and argument, I think is something very basic, very visceral 
to, to lawyers and non-lawyers alike. And I think that you know that there may be there may be something there may be something there um, it, it, in honing our arguments. And and, and now I've, I, I I'm sure I've used my time, and um, it's really important that we that we broaden the discussion. But thanks so much for for for, for having having me here, and, and and thanks for listening. Well, thank you so much for being here, Shami, and thank you so much for your contribution. That was just great. Um, and I feel so enthusiastic as well about what you're talking there um, about collaboration with, with people outside of the legal sector um, on its own. Um, I saw during um, everybody's talks, Michael had, or, or Mike, I, I'm not sure how you prefer to be referred to, um, but you had your notebook out. Um, so I thought you probably had some thoughts that you wanted to give um, if, if you do, like, feel free to go for it now and then I'll move on to the Q&A because we've had quite a lot of questions. Uh, yeah, well, I'm doing noughts and crosses actually now, so I wasn't really. Um, no, I, I just wanted to um, correct probably the impression that I gave, uh, which is erroneous. In fact, if I look back, I'm, I'm not going to say the number of years, I think a good, I don't know, quarter of my career, maybe more, third, is not in the courts at all. And you reminded me tonight of things that I sound like John Cleese, you know, when I was a young man in a shoebox <laughs> and all that stuff. But um, no, two things. I just illustrate that uh, I hope that the contribution is not limited to court actions. That that is the sharp end for a lawyer. But there is another way in which you can act and I've always encouraged younger lawyers than myself to participate in this and one thing probably no one will remember even now but during the miners strike obviously I was pretty active not just for Arthur but for, for many other uh, rank and file miners who were quite falsely charged with numerous offences and during that, it, it occurred to me, and it became extremely important for the print strike that followed and the print dispute and what was happening in London, close to the black shirt movement places in the 1930s and what Liberty was doing then, although then called the National Council of Civil, Civil Liberties. And myself and a number of people got together and I, I said, look, what, is in, what was important in the miners' cases, and the reason that we were successful in the miners' cases, uh, nearly all of them, and they had to keep dropping them, was legal, well, they didn't call themselves legal observers. They were ordinary people who decided, in the case of the miners, to come out with notebooks and with uh, cameras and so on, one of whom was a famous poster of the truncheon coming down of a, on the head of a woman. It missed just who was taking photographs. And I thought, we've got, to, we've got to formalize this. And so we set up something called the Legal Observers Group in the 1980s and 90s, where uh, in those days, uh, they seem a long time ago to me now, but anyway, yeah, out on the street in Wapping. And we, were, we organized ourselves very carefully in terms of the numbers out. So we had all the jackets, but we also decided we had to work in pairs. One person did the watching and the other person did the recording. It might not just be with a notebook, but it would be with a camera. In those days, it didn't have mobile phones. But I'll just come to that in one moment. This was extremely effective. The police didn't arrest us at that time, so it wasn't quite as bad as now. And we were obviously not liked at all, and they kept asking for our names and all the rest of it. But we also had another <clears throat> a scheme. I'm saying all this because this is the way you can get involved, I think, anyway, especially now. They might be doing, you know, they might be closing in on two legal observers, but we've got another lot over the way filming what they're doing. So everybody's covered. So it's a bit militaristic, really, about how you go about this. Mm -hmm. And everybody had instructions. Everybody had rights cards which could be given to people who were arrested with telephone numbers on it's all you know it's dated now you won't want to do it that way you do it uh, presumably through instantaneous communications and so on so that that's fine but it, it worked amazingly well and then there was a gap and then the people who were doing it sort of dissipated and went into other fields the other thing that happened after that again outside court but it was it's linked to court obviously in one sense 
we we sat up not not in competition with um, Liberty at all. Uh, a, a group it still exists, but it's not as well known now as it was then. Which is we called it a national civil rights movement, but if, effectively that was sort of coining a phrase. But the object was to bring together families who were facing uh, extraordinary situations. It may be, you know, like Hillsborough, or it may be Bloody Sunday, or it may be the Lawrence family. So it goes back over 20 years. And what was needed was effectively support and solidarity between the families so they can, as it were, swap experiences and they learn that they don't, as the Lawrences didn't, they don't have to take what they're told and go away with a pat on the head and it's all gonna be all right. That once they come together and realize these are the questions they've got to ask and, and we can help them with formulating the questions they need to ask of the authorities that are screwing them at that moment. So that was another thing. So I'm very, very keen on extra curricular activities for lawyers who've got, you know, they have got, or they shoot, hopefully got an objective in mind that if it goes wrong, they can, they have got recourse to the courts, but at the sharp end again is, is on the streets. There's no question about that. So I think, you know, I, I, I would hope that these initiatives, I was very interested to see what, hear what Audrey was saying and really pleased to know that there's a successor to this with mobile. I mean, if you think about the, the Floyd case that's just happened, it was cracked mm. by a mobile phone. Everybody's got them. They take really good photographs and nobody knows who's being photographed at any one time. They're not going to be able to shut it down, whatever they do. So, you know, observation. Yeah, absolutely spot on. Sorry, taking a bit of time just to come back on those. There are other examples, but those are some. No, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so to go to the attendees questions, we've got uh, quite a few on, um, a, I suppose, a, what we might call a constitutional crisis. Um, and we've got one in the chat to panellists from Zelia Edwards, but then also from Isabella Taylor in the Q&A. And Isabella says, how do we solve the issue of such an ineffective parliament with no functioning opposition or scrutiny, scrutiny pardon me, it feels as though the constitutional balance is completely off. How do you think this can be remedied? Um, and I suppose the natural person to answer that first is perhaps you, Shami, I, I would have thought. Well, I, I think that, um, you know, we've got this problem with this massive commons majority. And that, you know, that, you know, that is, that is a, that is a massive problem problem so things are not going to just be fixed in parliament however however um, on some of these issues one ought to be capable of um of inciting inspiring um even significant conservative rebellions around civil liberties issues i i, I do think that's possible i i, I look at um the work of big brother watch and others i think liberty was involved in this too but other you know in, in relation to this idea of um, internal COVID passports or ID being sort of rolled out in communities with all the dangers for that. There was very significant um, conservative um, uh, list of signatories to, to, to the Big Brother Watch statement on that. So, so I think, um, you know, all is not lost, but people care about what's happening outside parliament. They care about their post bag, they care about pictures from Clapham Common. They care, you know, uh, they care about international opinion. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a volatile moment in politics. So I don't think one should just despair um, at that. Um, and as for, you know, as for the, as for the Labour Party, as for, as, as for the official opposition, um, you know, if people are members of the party, they need to, you know, to stay. <laughs> And to make their voices heard, and, and and remember that you know the party had a devastating defeat, um, and so it needs to find its confidence again around around these issues. Um, but um, but there ought to be it, it ought to be possible to build cross party, um, non party, and extra political um, uh, opposition around these issues. And yes, we work in in parliament. It's a tough time in parliament at the moment, but. And yes, we work in the courts, but not just in the courts, but we work in the old media, in the new media, 
in communities, with trade unions, with every other civil society space. And we, and we do it in a coordinated way and we communicate and we, and we do it together. Thank you. And Michael, you've got your hand raised. <laughs> yes. Uh, this is an extracurricular activity I'm doing at the moment. So it's something that can be done now outside the courts. Uh, and I want to advertise it because it's very, I think it's an important alternative democracy, if you like, because I don't think we're going to get much out of this parliament. Whether we'll get out of the next, I don't know. I don't want to give up on it, but basically we've got to do something now. And what I want to uh, just, uh, just speak for a moment on people's commissions of inquiry, people's tribunals of inquiry, and so on. Now, this, this has a very uh, firm tradition. Uh, Bertrand Russell actually started it with the Russell Tribunals, which related to all sorts of places, but I, I sat for four years with them doing issues connected with Palestine. And so effectively it was outside the courts, but it was doing the job that courts and governments don't do. And of course, we didn't win favor with Israel for a start off, uh, who, who obviously they took quite severe action from time to time on what we were trying to do. Uh, and I've done another one in relation to Iran and I did it in The Hague. I've done four in the United Kingdom, one for the hospitals of Northwest London, another for the uh, hospital in Lewisham. I'm working on one for hospitals in Huddersfield. And at the moment I'm doing the People's COVID Inquiry. And we've had amazing response, not only from the bereaved, but also from very well-known speakers, met a lot of them from Independent Sage, who have a lot to say, obviously about Dominic Cummings and about Boris and decisions that he was taking. Just think for a moment of the kind of things he's been coming out with, like bodies were gonna stack up before he'd ever get to lockdown and what's behind the success, greed and capitalism. That's what he said. Now, and he's not gonna have a public inquiry. Uh, I've been trying to say that for ages. He'll never have one. Certainly not one he's in there because he's got too much to hide. So what we're trying to do is provide an alternative. Now it's, you know, it's modest, but in a sense, its ambition is much greater than that. Its horizons are much greater. And we are getting an amazing response. It's like tonight, really. It's as, we have to do it remotely at the moment. I much prefer it when we're all together in one place and it uh, can be felt more immediately. But so it's just another idea of another approach to a failing democracy. We are de democratically bankrupt. That's what I think. So people have got to have their own. That's why the Occupy movement was so important because they were actually, and they made, they had an amazing effect. And they were helped by a, a number of people. Uh, I was one, but there were many others who advised them about how they can go about it and what they did, uh, both here and in the United States. So it's just another idea, another thought for the day. Thank you very much. Um, do any of our other speakers want to come, come in on that or should I move on to the next question? Okay, I'll move on. Um, there was a question just, just as an um, interlude from Emily Precious about how you become a legal observer. Um, for anybody that's interested, Black, uh, pro sorry, Black Protest Legal Support, uh, there's a website online that gives you details of how you can join up to that organisation. There's also Green and Black Cross. Um, obviously, we have Audrey here from Black Protest Legal Support. So um, do get in touch. Mm -hmm. If it's okay with you, I can put a few links onto the chat. Please, yeah, oh. that, would be, that would be incredibly helpful. Thank you. So thanks for your question there, Emily. Um, we also have, and, and this is kind of so... I know, um, Katie, you were talking before about how effective um, an advocate the judiciary is in general. And we have a question here from Cushy, which says, how influential or effective do you think the judiciary can be in identifying the flaws of legislation whilst bearing in mind the rule of law and the separation of powers? Not, not, not an easy one. Not <laughs> No, I don't know. About, I don't know how to even begin to answer that. Well, I mean, Shami's, Shami's yeah. also got a hand up, so she'll help you out in a minute. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm happy to defer to Shami. I think, I guess, I had two reasons for saying what I said about judges. First of all, is that they are this, the 
kind of huge potential for them to be attacked uh, by the government in the same way that the government attacks lawyers generally, but particularly judges as kind of elitist, out of touch figures, and also as figures who are kind of separate from the democratic process, kind of meddling in something which is kind of not really their place. Um, but then my second point was, was just, I mean, I guess it's also about perception, but rather than the kind of government um, portrayal as out of touch, uh, members of the elite. I think that that's probably um, the public perception as well, whether or not the government portrays judges like that. Like, I think the courts are something which don't necessarily feel as though they're part of the everyday democratic process. And I think for people to see that big decisions are being made by a very small minority of people um, can feel um, alienating. In terms of how influential judges can be, I mean, obviously they're hugely influential and we really rely on them to protect our rights. Like, I'm not saying that I would get rid of the judiciary or that we, you know, I think the system that we have, the kind of, I saw it described so recently as idiotic doctrine of parliamentary supremacy, like the only check that we really have on the executive in our constitution is the judiciary. And so we absolutely need to rely on an independent judiciary to, to protect and enforce our rights. So inevitably they will be extremely influential. But yeah, I just did hear what Shami's got to add. Um, uh, well, I, 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 I agree with Katie, but all I would say though, is that um, just because politicians keep denigrating judges doesn't mean it necessarily sticks with the public. I haven't done any polling or focus grouping on this for a while, not since I left liberty but the last time I did the um on the sort of trust index people still have quite a high regard for for judges in in this country um however there's been a drip drip attack on the judiciary I'm, I'm sorry to say by senior politicians again of both colors over over a number of years and crucially you know judges don't command armies you know judges are vulnerable to um to political threats to legislative threats to you know attacks on their jurisdiction on their composition um etc cetera, etc cetera. and this is the kind of government that will will do that um so so, so, so katie's right there too that we have to um i mean i think it's really interesting that that um that uh, w was it audrey or was it katie somebody quoted john laws um, on rowdy, I think it was Audrey perhaps on on rowdy rowdy protests. That's um, I think it's a wonderful tribute to um, to to John um, who was in you know my chambers and 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 who who passed away just not so long ago because he wasn't regarded as a as a radical judge or even a desperately progressive judge. He was you know quite an establishment quite an establishment figure probably. You know, liberal conservative in in his views, but that, but that approach to both the rule of law and to peaceful dis dissent, to to protest being rowdy, is a is a really fertile theme, which is why I do think this police etc. bill um, is is something to to really to to really focus on. So yes, judges can be very influential in their in their comments in in court and you know, and, and, and outside court. Yes, the judiciary even is under threat at the moment. Um, so, so Katie's right, we've got to rely on them as, as, as a last resort, but, but not, not too often and not too much. Thank you. And Chai, you've got your hand up to answer that question as well. Uh, I think just specifically on, on the bit of the question that was talking specifically about legislation um, mm -hmm. and judges' powers to, to, to to identify flaws in in primary legislation, I think um, you know there are obviously legal mechanisms by which you can do that um, through things like the Human Rights Act, which which allow judges to look at it. But it does become really really tricky once things have been through Parliament as primary or secondary legislation. And one of the things that we see is that you know even as there are very important and high profile cases where judges are able to properly look at um, an act of parliament and identify things with it that, that contravene human rights so very rarely um, or interpret it in a way that, that conforms with the rule of law, it is very difficult for them. And particularly at, in the lower courts and in the court of appeal and 
with things that don't always get the attention that they deserve and don't get to the Supreme Court, don't get you know proper arbitration, it there is an extraordinary pressure on on the judiciary to defer to often a completely illusory impression of what passes for parliamentary scrutiny. Like you have obviously, you know, secondary legislation is rubber stamped. Lots of legislation that goes through parliament is never properly debated or considered by parliamentarians. Um, but there are many constitutional conventions and just also an instinct, I think, for self-preservation in the courts that makes it very difficult to deal with practical problems of, of legislation that, that, that is harmful, or that, that causes problems um, through the courts and, and with judges. Not to say it can't happen, but you really want to avoid things that are bad getting in, in, into primary legislation because it just becomes much, much harder to deal with. Definitely. Um, Michael, do you have your hand up to answer this question or is it from the last one? No, no, good heavens not, no. I was actually going to say, if I can take the opportunity, I've only got a few more minutes left. I don't know how long you want to go on. But... Only till um, half past eight, if that's okay with you. And oh, yeah, yeah. Close yeah. Off. So, so just a minute. Um, and one thing I know um, Audrey said earlier on that obviously... Um, we have a wide audience and um, we often have people attending these um, meetings who are at the very start of their career and Daniel I, I'm so sorry Daniel I'm not going to get your last name right um, I, I'm going to read it's grace uh, but I suspect that's wrong and apologies from me for that um, but he asks do you feel involvement and possible arrest in direct action and protests could or would jeopardize someone's prospects at the beginning of their legal career I'll start with you there Audrey interesting question I mean it's um it's difficult because it's it's already a difficult profession to get into you know um and of course everybody's got to think about them, these things themselves but I can't see incredibly progressive sets being like oh yeah you were out there protesting and uh using your voice and then were criminalized by an authoritarian state I'm sorry you're not you're not you're not good enough you know it's 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 almost the opposite, right? Um, it's, it's, here's how committed you are. Um, it's a difficult question because it, it, it's, it's difficult to get into and you never want anything to hinder your progress. But um, I think, look, the, the fact is this, being at a protest, being a legal observer, um, uh, you know, um, those, you have a right to do that. Um, it's not unlawful. Um, so you're not you're not committing a criminal offense by going out there and doing that. I know you've also mentioned direct action protests, um, which is obviously taking the next step. Um, but I don't know. My view is, you know, depending on where you want to go, only so seem like something even better. But again, everybody needs to make those decisions for themselves. Thank you so much. Um, go on, Katie. Just wanted to add really quickly that. Um, to what Audrey said, I think there's also a role for the regulators to play, so for the um, Bar Standards Board, um, for the Solicitor's Regulation Authority, I think there is probably not currently clarity about how um, a conviction for protest-related offence would be treated by our regulators. I think there's probably something there that lawyers, um, current practising lawyers, should be doing to engage with both those bodies to try and clarify whether um, you know, what action would be taken against an aspiring or, or practicing solicitor or barrister who, who was criminalized for engaging in, um, in a protest, especially if that was you know, around Black Lives Matter or, or anything really. But when you take, consider the importance of the recent movements, I think that's something that we as a profession should be doing. Sorry to interrupt, but that's such a brilliant idea, Katie. Perhaps the young, the young legal aid lawyers should, should, write, yeah. um, uh, should write to um, the regulators Definitely, um, and, and set out some specific scenarios and, and, and questions about, uh, about in the light of this, perhaps in the light of this police um, legislation, this police etc. legislation and part three. Um, it would be an interesting. It would be an interesting intervention in itself, wouldn't it? It would be. It would be. It would be pragmatic and sensible for, for protecting members, but it would also be quite an interesting um, protest intervention, campaigning intervention in itself. Yeah, definitely. It's such a good point. And actually, um, Derek Sweeting QC, who's the new Bar Council leader, um, se seems pretty pro 
progressive, I suppose. Um, we'll see. Um, Michael, sorry, you had your hand up. Yeah, well, I've had a, a number of years of experience at this. <laughs> I've had to weigh up very carefully and, and um, all sorts of people have made uh, suggestions about my behaviour, so that won't surprise anybody. <laughs> um, but I think uh, I have a rule of thumb in order to survive. Uh, one is that I think you have every right to be a legal observer. And, I, I, you know, if you get arrested for that, and I think, as you say, some people have been, there, there should be no repercussions for that. Uh, and, and in fact, the, the opposite, there should be repercussions for those doing the arresting. So I, I think that's not a problem. I think if you're going on a march, of which I've been on many, I mean, Iraq, you, you name it, I've, I've probably been there, uh, one way or another, spoken at some of them. So I think, I don't think that causes a problem that you, you should be, I think the problem comes, there is a fine line, obviously, between, you know, um, well, if, if they're going to basically criminalise presence, because I think it has been mentioned in the, the bill, I think aren't they wishing to, uh, in some way or another, criminalise a lone protester? In other words, right, even if it's only one, now then we're getting a problem. And I think that's why I think the idea that Katie's had is, is a good one. That has to be that has to be distilled and clarified right now so that lawyers who want to get active know where the lines are. I've only drawn ones in the sand just for my own benefit. I've just about survived. Thank you so much. Um, Try, is your hand up to answer this one as well? Yeah, I mean, just very quickly, and I think, I mean, people have sort of said this, but there's obviously a difference between direct action, which is committing a non-violent criminal offence deliberately, um, often because you want to get arrested and sort of being inadvertently criminalised in, in a protest. And I think, again, because of the position of, well, I mean, of lawyers uh, with respect to the law and the courts and the regulators, like I think one of them is a lot more difficult to, to, to think about than the other. Um, and yeah, and I think so we can get clarity and we should get more clarity about how those sorts of things would be treated. But I think the kinds of direct action that you might have been referring to um, are things where it, it, it is very difficult for lawyers, particularly lawyers starting their careers, to, to think about engaging in those because you will run into problems with, with your regulator and with, with being called or being um, admitted to the role. Unless you glue yourself to a policeman. <laughs> But well, why would you want to be glued to a policeman, Michael? <laughs> He's not going to be able to arrest you. No, that's. I, I think. Look, obviously, it's. Um, that's, it's joking. always a matter of personal conscience. But I think if you were asking about the practicalities of it, um, that there is a difference between those two things, and I think I think that's something to. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. Oh, well, brilliant. Um, so we are, we're literally just in time. Um, thank you all so much um, for coming tonight and for your contributions. It's been a, a really brilliant event. Um, and I know that we've had thanks galore from people in the chat and um, we've got a huge number of questions that we've not had time to answer. Um, but I think that's testament to the enthusiasm of the audience for everything that you said. So thank you so much for taking the time. I won't keep you any longer, um, but we are very, very grateful. Great so sharing. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. And Thank your you patience. So <laughs> Thank you elder. so much. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. So take, every, uh, take care, everyone. I'm going to okay, sign bye. off now. Goodbye.